Thanks, Garrett. I feel like it was Retro Sunday here at Life Christian Fellowship. We go by Life Church now, but those first two songs go back, what, Garrett, at least, what, 25 years for us here? Pretty amazing. God has been absolutely faithful to us. We are in 2 Thessalonians, and if you have your Bible, I'd like for you to open it up, whether it's on your phone. Silence your phone if you haven't already done that. You don't want to have people give you dirty looks when your phone goes off, all right? But 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, all right? That will be our focus. We are heading into a closing segment of 2 Thessalonians. And uh, it's going to begin with, finally, brothers and sisters. With the Apostle Paul, as well as, remember, he's got two buddies that are with him in ministry. And it's Silas and Timothy. And they're all involved in sending these letters. And as they send these letters, um, they're going to come traditionally like Paul does in his letters and writings when he gets down to the final stuff. And sometimes the final stuff can be long. In Romans, it's several chapters. But the idea is that Paul usually moves a little bit away from theology, although we're going to find a lot, theology, study of God, but we're going to find a lot of that today. But especially, he usually moves towards real practical instructions and sometimes personal greetings. He often heads into the issues of live like this, practice this kind of thing. So I've laid out the, the, the foundation for biblical thinking and what it means to be a devoted follower of Jesus. And now I need you to put this into practice. And you'll find a little bit of that here. But it's important stuff, and we're going to look at three prime elements that are really practical for us, but really important for us to shape the way that we think as believers and followers of Jesus. So I want you to follow along. This is New Living Translation. Finally, dear brothers and sisters, we ask you to pray for us. Pray that the Lord's message will spread rapidly and be honored wherever it goes, just as when it came to you. Now, pray, too, that we will be rescued from wicked and evil people, for not everyone is a believer, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. And we are confident in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we commanded you. May the Lord lead your hearts into a full understanding and expression of the love of God and the patient endurance that comes from Christ. Now, that's our focus in those first five verses of Thessalonians chapter 3. Oh, you got to come for next week. Next Sunday is a barn burner. It basically says, quit being lazy. If you don't work, you shouldn't be eaten. So get with it, all right? So we're going to look at that next week. (laughs) It's a good one. So there's three elements that I want to take you to. And uh, finally, brothers and sisters, Paul says, and what he does is he begins with a request. Now, you won't find a lot of requests from Paul. He is uh, in many ways such a selfless individual. And uh, he has come in and started these letters, and he's always commended these new believers who live in Thessalonica. But he does come now with a request, and it has to do with the mission that he's on, but he says, I really need you to pray for us. Paul understood here that the work that I have to do is not by just organization abilities, and it's not by just you know, strategies of man's ways, but instead he understands that um, we need the power of the Spirit and we need God to work within us and uh, advance what he is doing. So I want you to understand, first of all, the very verb here when Paul says, pray for us, it is in present tense. For those of you who love the English language or you love to parse words, But it really stresses a continuing action. So Paul is saying, I want you to continually pray for us. Keep on praying for us. Don't quit praying for us. That's the request that he makes. And when he asks for them to pray for him, he asks that they would pray that the Lord's message. Um, There's a a, a strong sense here where he understands that that he is going out and he's spreading good news and he's preaching the gospel, but he understands, I didn't make this stuff up. 
And this isn't just my preaching abilities. He understands that this is the very message that comes from Christ himself. And so there is a divine sense of the power of uh, this good news that is proclaimed. And Paul focuses in on, in this prayer, we are running with the gospel. That's the word that talks about spread, and especially when you add uh, an adverb to it that we'll look at in a moment. But, but the idea is that this Lord's message, it belongs to him. It's his good news. It's not just my preaching abilities. It is his good news. And he sees that as spreading out and saturating all people everywhere. He sees the good news as saturating the entire world. That's where his faith level is. So may the Lord's message spread... Uh, may it run, it's a vivid me metaphor expressing Paul's desire for the swift spread of the gospel in light of the imminent return of the Lord. He doesn't know his shelf life, how much time he has. He knew that his time was short when he was in Thessalonica because of the trouble that came. So what he says is, I don't know exactly my time frame, and I don't know how long all of our time frame is because the Lord will return. But while we have this window of opportunity, pray that the gospel spreads. And um, Paul may be alluding actually to Psalm 147.15 that pictures when God speaks, he gives a command to the earth and his word runs swiftly. That's the idea. That God speaks and he has such authority over all the world, whether they acknowledge it or not, but when he gives a decree and a command, they go with it. For those of you who are reading with us through Isaiah, you find this prophecy of a guy named Cyrus, and it's over 100 years before Cyrus is even born, and yet the prophecy is there. But the idea is this, that I'm just going to raise someone up, and that one is going to be right in the palm of my hand, and that one is going to do what I command him to do, and he's going to release God's people out of their captivity, and God is going to bring about restoration. So the idea is this. That God's word, when it goes forth, it is going to go forth and accomplish what it is sent to do. God's word, this Lord's message, is not anemic or powerless. It is charged with life-giving energy of the Spirit. It is the power of God unto salvation. It moves, and as it moves, Paul says, pray that the running of this message, that it's done with a real sense of a rapid pace, Rapidly is the word as a qualifier that's used. Um, Paul speaks and says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I see it as the very power of God working for the salvation of everyone who believes it, both Jew and Greek. I see it in God's plan for imparting righteousness to men, a process begun and continued by their faith. So Paul sees the power not in his abilities or in his preaching, not the power of even that local church, but he sees it. The message alone has the power to transform and change. Now, sometimes we've lost sight of that as the church, that we are founded upon the Lord Jesus Christ, but the very message that he comes to deliver from the Father is real, it is dynamic, it is charged with the power to save and transform lives. And so we pray that this move, and it move at a quick, fast pace, for it is God's will that none would perish, but all come unto repentance. There's another qualifier, and it's with honor. Pray that the Lord's message that goes forth and runs throughout this area that Paul is speaking about where he's ministering, but also all over the world, that it's honored wherever it goes. Paul wants the gospel, the universal message of salvation, to spread out continually, rapidly, but to be honored also continually. Present tense, once again. I want you to continue, continually pray, but pray that it goes out rapidly and continually is being honored wherever it goes. Paul's earlier stress on the model of the response from the Thessalonian Christians the fact that they, in honor, received this message, um, it made a difference, it changed their lives. And Paul says, just like there was honor when you received that, I want that same kind of honor wherever it is proclaimed. So you pray with us. We're running with the gospel. 
may it be done rapidly, but also with honor. Now, we have to always remind ourselves that we are not entertainers. That's not what the church is about. We are not manipulative salespersons. I'm not. None of us in the room are. We are not consumed by mere messaging or slogans. Lost people need a clear path away to salvation, not self-improvement. Paul doesn't see himself as a social influencer. He knows himself that he is an apostle. And it's a big term, but it basically means I've been sent on a mission. I'm just a servant that's been sent, and so I go. But as I go, may I go, and may the Lord's message go out, and may it be done with honor. Now, for us in application, we must communicate clearly, understandably, and so as a result, we've got to be able to connect with an audience and somehow find a relatability of where our individuals so that we can begin to connect with them with the good news. But I'll also tell you this, we don't reach people because we're a relatable church. We reach people because we honor the very message that we have been given to proclaim. There must be a deep sense inside of who we are. We have heard from the Lord. We have heard his message. And that's where the power is. Religious leaders recognize that imprint that was upon the disciples, the imprint of the very nature of Jesus, the honorable Savior. And so religious leaders, as much as they hated them, when they saw the complete assurance that was inside those disciples, Peter, John, in Acts chapter 4, they were obviously uneducated and untrained men, but the religious leaders, it says, were staggered. For they recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. There was a deep, deep sense of honor. And then the Apostle Paul gives this qualifier also. It's just basically just like you. We want this thing to be honored just like it was honored when it was proclaimed to you. This is the idea of don't forget what took place in your life when that gospel was first planted in. And when it came in and you embraced it, it transformed and changed your life because it was a message like no other message. He's probably referring back to his first letter in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Therefore, we never stop thanking God that when you received this message from us, you didn't think of our words as mere human ideas. You accepted what we said as the very word of God, which of course it is. And this word continues to work in you who believe. Now, there's an interesting request. Paul doesn't spend much time soliciting prayer for his protection. He knows there's always troubles. He knows that there's always struggles. He knows he is in a dangerous business. And yet what you will find is he is going to make a further request in prayer. But understand this. Paul knew and experienced great suffering. And he was a lead example for those who were his spiritual children in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. Uh, by the way, earlier before he even writes this, he pens in, I can't believe I'm saying these things. But what he does is he just basically comes and says, you think you have it hard? Listen, this is my resume. This is what I have been through for the sake of the gospel. The catch as he goes on. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. Trouble follows me wherever I go. But he says in verse 2, but I want you to pray too that we will be rescued from wicked and evil people, for not everyone is a believer. Paul is not saying, I want to stay out of hot water because I want a more convenient life. Most likely what he is saying here is he is addressing the issue of the wicked. And by the way, the word wicked means, in, in this context, the word that's used there, it means those who are out of place, which is really an interesting perspective. Most likely what he is referring to, those that are out of place, most likely he's using this as a nuance to talk about the fact that on the inside of the church, inside of the ranks of the faith, there are people that come who are false individuals. They speak falsely, they act falsely, 
They are not the real McCoy. Um, so Paul is praying here, I want to be able to preach the gospel, and as the Lord's message runs in front of us, and as we proclaim it, as it's moving out, we want it to be unhindered by the ones who will come and try to manipulate and control and turn it about themselves. It's more in focus is probably those who profess belief are part of the church community, but they're out of place there because they are not genuine believers. These false ones who infiltrate the church for personal gain, manipulation, control, are inspired by wicked plots to lead people astray and to cripple the church from fruitfulness and faithfulness. By the way, times haven't exactly changed. There continues to be, even in our generation, individuals that are involved in church and church work, and it has far more to do about with them than the simple, humble servant work of serving Jesus. Paul speaks of them and says, these people are false, false. they're just farts, that's what they are, no. <laughs> these people are false apostles. Sometimes you get tongue-tied, right? They are deceitful workers who disguise themselves as apostles. That must be the message paraphrase that I uh, mentioned on that one. But they are deceitful workers who disguise themselves as apostles of Christ, but I am not surprised because even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no wonder that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. In the end, they will get the punishment their wicked deeds deserve. Jesus uses these powerful words in the Sermon on the Mount. It is not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, we cast out demons in your name, we perform many miracles in your name, but I will reply, but I never knew you. So get away from me, you who break God's law. Um, Paul is saying, I need you to pray for me because <clears throat> the evil one will come in such a way that he will disguise himself and there will be individuals that show up and they seem as if they are brothers and sisters. And by the way, this doesn't call for us to be skeptical about everybody. But we also have to be very, very wise that we use discernment and that we're careful to live according to the scriptures, not by manipulative words and ways of people. You will always find a brand of Christianity that will take an easy road and will warp the words that flow from the mouth of Jesus. Churches are filled today with individuals that are preaching messages that do not align with the scriptures and the word of God. Um, guard yourself. There's an image here in this running of... Uh, of the Olympic Games, the Greek Games. Paul employs it here. When the runners run, they run rapidly, they want run with honor, but the idea is so that they will receive the honor and the glory as part of the victory prize. So Paul's probably using that, that Greek picture to give an allusion to the Old Testament depiction of God's word that runs out into the world and accomplishes what it has been sent to do. The gospel itself is running for the prize, namely victory over people's hearts and over false religions and philosophies that have competed with the gospel and formerly held pagans in their grasp. But the gospel of Christ is always the true winner against all competing worldviews, the gospel, the good news, will stand, for it is the message of the Lord. Okay, there's a second uh, element that I want to draw attention to, and it's, it's a confession. It's a confession that begins with these words, but the Lord is faithful. Paul now expresses confidence. You see, he does not want prayers of alarm or fear from these believers in Thessalonica. He's saying, I need you to pray for me. Yes, we're up against some strong odds, but the message of the Lord is going out. We pray that it goes rapidly. We pray that it's held with honor. We pray that as it goes out, that it will be unhindered. And as you received it, we pray that in the same way, that kind of honor and that kind of strength in planting the gospel 
Uh, May that take place. Stand firm, Christians, face the fight with the hordes of hell. But we do it with a confident confession, our God is faithful. Well, let's look at those two verses again, shall we? Verses 3 and 4 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, But the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. We are confident in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do the things we commanded you to do. So God is faithful, and in His faithfulness, He is strengthening and guarding us, His people, His children, from the evil one. In other words, don't move in your prayer life, and when you come with the request before God, yeah, it's a dangerous business that I'm involved in, but the power of God is going forth, and I don't want your prayers that are rooted in doubts and fears. I do not want you to be alarmed. I want you to have great confidence, and our confidence is Paul would say, it's not in my abilities. My confidence is in the faithfulness of God, and I need you to be confident in His faithfulness as well. He will strengthen. He will guard you. Um, The context here is that there is obedient service to Christ and to His mission. In other words, God is faithful to strengthen and guard us as we do His works. There's an evil one who's aligned against us, and the running of this good news, but we can have confidence in God. He will do in us and will continue to do in us what He needs to do so that we can continue in the way. So there's a reminder that God's kingdom is not dependent on people, but God's kingdom is dependent upon the king. Now, Paul uses this expression of the word command. He says that you will continue to do Um, I'm confident in this. You're going to continue in the way. You'll continue to do what I have commanded you to do. Uh, Eric, you'll be thrilled to know it's a military order here that Paul uses. That's the kind of idea. In other words, when I sat down with you, I gave the commands that I received as commands from Jesus himself. So I've commissioned you and I've sent you out and you have stayed in that. You've been faithful in this command that's been passed down from a superior officer. And by the way, Paul uses this, words, this word repeatedly in both 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Paul understands that he has been given marching orders for his life by Christ himself. So it is not strange for him to speak with confidence to these spiritual offspring and say, listen, I gave you strong instructions. I gave you the command. It was the command that had given me by the Lord himself. And what he would say to them is, we are engaged in spiritual battle, therefore I am, I'm just laying it out. This is the command I give you. It mirrors the commission of Jesus in the Great Commission, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Yes, everything I have commanded you. In other words, Jesus is looking at disciples and says, listen, I'm giving you your marching orders, but I need you to go and do that as well. We spend and waste way too much time just entertaining people and worrying about what everybody's feelings are. Jesus sees the gospel as something that has been commanded us. It has been loosed by God. It is spreading rapidly. We embrace it. We live it out. In a battle, it is not enough for only officers to fight. Every soldier must do his or her duty. It is also true in the work of the local church. In the proclamation of the gospel, the advancement of the kingdom, we need to fall in line and advance God's kingdom and be involved in it. What if an army were run by the same lack of obedience, order, and discipline that we often see in the local church? We would be in big, 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 big trouble. How would it be possible for God's work to spread rapidly and with honor without this deep sense of we have marching orders, therefore this is how we live, this is how we work? If the, res- if the recruits disobeyed their officers' orders the way some church members disobey the word of God, they would be court-martialed. That's a little bit of an ouch statement, but it is so, so true, isn't it? Now, in context here, we understand this is obedient service. We always remember that the outcomes of obedient service rests on the faithfulness of God to work within people. I like that. I like the fact that God's building His kingdom, but it's, it's on Him. It is on the King. I know you have doubts about people like I have doubts about people. Don't we all have doubts about people? Um, 
I was reading, somebody was talking about, uh, anyway, it was one of those YouTube lists kind of thing, and somebody's waxing eloquently. They're saying, especially as you get into the later years of your life, pay attention because there are some people that you just can't listen to. And so it gave 10 different kinds of individuals. I think the first one was a gossip. Somewhere in there were telemarketers or shady contractors that will tell you there's something wrong. Maybe auto mechanics, these kinds of things. In other words, what he's saying is, you may be a little bit older and kinder and gentler, but uh, uh, don't be gullible. And somebody in the response in the comments on the video put down, in other words, number one, people, 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 people. And then they put down in 10 was everybody else, okay? Now, sometimes that gets inside of us, but I want to just reassure you and remind you today that if God's kingdom is dependent on people, then it is a fragile, fickle, and doomed to fail. But the kingdom is not dependent on people. The kingdom is dependent upon the king. He rules. He protects. He inspires. He has promised he will build his church and hell will not prevail. Nor will those who are the opponents of the preaching of the gospel. He is the king and we can count on him. We can count on him. So I want you to have confidence when you pray. I want you to guard against discouragement. I want you to guard against despair. This is not the will of God for the church. We may be in challenging or difficult times, but that is not the will of God for the church for us to somehow be converted to pessimism, where all we see is that the sky is falling. Our God is still on the throne. He is king. We have confidence in him. Do you remember Elijah? 1 Kings chapter 19, he had gotten into his pity party. There he is in the mountainside lair. And he says to God, I have zealously served the Lord Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you. They've torn down your altars. They've killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left. Now they're trying to kill me too. God speaks and says, listen, there's 7,000 others here in Israel who have not bowed down to Baal or kissed him. And I am still at work. And there is a next king to be crowned. And there's another prophet that will come following you. And he encourages him and says, listen, you've got your eyes off me and you've gotten it on your circumstances. And so you have become this pessimist. Where are you, Elijah? You know who I called you to be. I need you to hear from me. I need you to see from my perspective. Paul here goes through difficulties in his ministry, but he is confident in the Lord. He's confident in the Lord and he looks to the church, those Christians in Thessalonica and says, you are doing and will continue to do God's work that we commanded to you. I have confidence in you. And by the way, I'm just going to head to this one. This is why we're a next generation church and that's one of our prime values here at Life Church. It's a value that is based on this confident confession that God is faithful. Dying churches lose hope in the future because they've lost connection with the God who saves, transforms, and blesses his children. It is a spiritual problem when we cannot see hope ahead of us in the next generation. Now, the next generation has its challenges, its failings, but so did Peter and the other disciples. Jesus said to those young, vulnerable leaders, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. And even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask anything in my name, I will do it so the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Jesus sees these ones who will clearly fail him, deny him, betray him, forsake him. But Jesus knows the Father. And Jesus knows that the Father will pour out his spirit. And Jesus speaks to these disciples and says, listen, you watch the dads of this world. They're not perfect for sure. Lots of failings, but even dads know how to give good gifts to their children. How much more will your heavenly Father, um, how much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him? So I want you to find hope and let this be your confession. Our God is faithful. I put my trust in him. So we pray. The gospel's running out. 
but we give strong confession. The confession is that our God is faithful. Okay? May this always be our confession. Our God is faithful. He will strengthen us. He will guard us from the evil one. And we are confident the work he begins in us. He will sustain us that we might do and continue to do everything that he has commanded us. And there's one more thing that I want to draw attention to, a third element. And it's in verse 5. There is kind of this blessing that comes. It's a prayer blessing. And Paul begins it with these words, May the Lord. May the Lord lead your hearts into a full understanding expression of the love of God and the patient endurance that comes from Christ. A soldier obeys primarily out of loyalty and fear. You're going to be in big trouble if you do not follow the commands of your senior officer. But for the Christian, it is different. We have a much higher motive for obedience. Yes, we fear the Lord, but we have God's love that is real and tangible, and we have the promise that Christ shall return for us. Back in John chapter 14, Jesus lays it out. If you love me, then just follow my ways. Keep my commandments. A commanding officer does not require his men to love him, but if they do, they will respect and obey him with greater diligence. The history of warfare records heroic deeds done by men who loved their leaders and willingly died for them. But the best example of all is the one Jesus who came. And may God give us this full understanding and expression of God's unmeasurable love for us. And as a result, that he pours into us the patient endurance for us to continue to follow him in all of his ways until the return of Christ. Well, there's an old gospel song that says, The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bow down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. The final verse says this, so poetic. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. And the chorus merely says, O love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. What's going to keep you going when times are tough? What's going to keep you standing firm? And Paul speaks to the church there at Thessalonica and says, there is no better thing, there is no greater thing than for you to understand and comprehend the love of God for you. This love of God that passes measure. One of Paul's most musicians come, would you? One of Paul's most powerful prayers is found at the close of Ephesians chapter 3. Paul speaks of God's grace given to him to preach the good news to the Gentiles, which includes his spiritual children there in Ephesus. He says, oh, God gave me great grace. And it was the, yes, the command, but it was, it was the ability, and he came in with his, the charged power of his spirit. And I came to you and and proclaimed the gospel. The idea is that God is fulfilling his plan and he's doing it through the church. Paul speaks of God's manifold wisdom that it's being displayed as the church is being formed and the gospel is being planted. And it's being displayed to what he says is, is rulers and authorities. In other words, the spiritual realm is being transformed and it is changing. And God's making a display of all of his mercy and all of his grace. But it has not come without suffering. And Paul tells the believers in Ephesus, I do not want you to be discouraged. 
I am engaged in this difficult work, but this work is good because it is filled with glory. And he speaks and says, it is filled with glory for you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. And then comes the prayer of blessing in verses 14 through the close of the chapter, verse 21 in Ephesians 3. It is for this reason that I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his riches, glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long, high, deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Not to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Paul is praying. I want you to get a little bit of a glimpse into the love of God that is so great and so strong and so amazing. But I want you to be able to see it and understand it and know it, even though it is beyond measure. But our God is able to do exceeding abundantly, immeasurably more than all we ask or can even imagine. And may he do this for you, that you are overwhelmed and lost in the love of God. So that in this journey, this stand firm journey, that we continue to pray and never cease to pray, that the gospel run, that it go everywhere, rapidly, that it's honored everywhere, just like it happened within your heart when Christ was honored inside of you and you acknowledge, oh, I am a sinner, but you are my savior. He pray that that takes place Always being confident, our God is faithful. He will do His work. His work is dependent on Him and not on us. And then this final just point of blessing, and may the Lord help us to always see it and always remember. It's part of the reason He calls us back to the table. As often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, we proclaim, we remember and proclaim the Lord's death, his awesome love for us until he comes. Bow your hearts with me.